Siloampool, and talk about some ivory fragments found in Jerusalem, which is a very excited, exciting find. Then about a newly excavated summer house south of Jerusalem. And finally, a royal palace with Persian gardens also south of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at this uh, slide, this drawing of Jerusalem in the time of Christ, you can see the temple here and the city walls, Herod's palace here, the pools of Bethesda. But I want to go here to the south where the pool of Siloam is located. And some interesting things are happening there. I've been there quite a few times, and if you go there, you can see the steps going down that was part of the Siloam pool. It's been like found a few years ago, and uh, it's only a limited portion of the pool that you can see here. It was actually uh, uh, found when they put this big black sewer <laughs> through uh, the city, and they found them, uh, this, this area. Now, the pool of Siloam is, of course, uh, known to us from, from John chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, where Jesus spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And on the left here, you can see a, a, an artist's impression of this man washing his uh, eyes in the pool of Siloam. It's a very interesting event this is. You may think it's not very hygienic to spit on the ground to make a bit of mud and put on the man's eyes and then you wash and you can see. But I believe you need to focus on what comes out of the mind, out of the mouth of Jesus, the words which he spoke. And if that is mixed with the clay, the dust from which you are made, and we go to the pool of Siloam, the name Siloam means scent. Uh, a type of the word of God which has been sent to us then we can all see. And here you can see a reconstruction drawing, which I made many years ago. Uh, you can see, at the moment, you can only see this part of the pool with these steps going down. It was much larger. And interesting is now, it, it was actually the part of what the um, City of David people want to do is to open the road that runs from the Siloam pool going up and up and up to the Temple Mount. And already for some years, you've been able to walk below or through the drain that runs below this street and has been excavated on the ground. So here you can see that underneath the existing road, they build these massive metal frames. And on here you can actually walk on the original paving stones of the street that led up from the Siloam pool to the, uh, to the Temple Mount. So again, the only portion you can see are these steps here. Uh, the excavators couldn't continue because of uh, these uh, shrubs and bushes that are here behind this chicken wire. And on the other side is just a neglected garden that belonged to the Greek Orthodox Church. And what has been apparently achieved is that this area has been made available for excavation. And here you can see, this is a small portion which you can visit, but the whole area of the pool is now being excavated and has been cleaned out of all the rubble to prepare it for proper archaeological excavations when all the steps are ex being able to excavate it. So here we can see this is a street that runs up to the Temple Mount, and here you see the trucks and um, picking up all the rubble that have been put in bags, and that is going to be carted away. And then hopefully the idea is that there's a reconstruction drawing of the pool that you can actually see the whole of the pool of, of Siloam. And that would be a major tourist attraction. And they hope to use it also for uh, ritual bathing. So they plan to have uh, these wooden structures with uh, curtains so people are shielded when they bathe. And uh, on the south here, the pool has been closed by the city wall that was built originally in the time of Hezekiah. So hopefully we can see part of this city wall as well. There was in this particular uh, point uh, um, uh, the, um, the dam that was built to stop the waters from flowing into the Ketone Valley. And, but here it also makes it possible 
for this world's reservoir to be filled. So hopefully in a few years' time, we can go to Jerusalem and, and see this, this beautiful pool. Not too far from the Siloam pool, but higher up the hill, closer to the Temple Mount, they're also excavating in the area and they found some amazing ivory fragments dating from the time of King Uzziah. We know from Chronicles that Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem, the corner gate and the valley gate and at the corner buttons of the wall. He fortified them. He built towers in the day. He was a great builder and he also loved, as I say, husbandry, agriculture. So he made Jerusalem uh, prosperous again. The area where the ivory fragments were found is a reconstruction drawing of the city of Solomon. Before it was extended by Hezekiah, that uh, you encompass all of the Western Wall. We know where the Valley Gate is located. It had been excavated in 1927. The Corner Gate is probably the corner of the Temple. And right in between here in this area, a new excavation has uh, revealed some ivory fragments. Now we know about ivory fragments because uh, the ones you see here, they're only very small little plaques. Uh, they were excavated in Samaria, in what is generally understood to be Ahab's palace. And when you read in Kings chapter 22 and verse 39, King Ahab had an ivory palace in Samaria. We mustn't think that the whole palace was made of ivory. You could need about a, a million uh, elephants uh, to get their tusk and to build a palace from. But uh, they... The furniture was often inlaid with ivory pieces. So these have been found in uh, Samaria. And here, I'd like to uh, listen to the excavators themselves. They were so excited when they found all these fragments. Let's listen to this little clip. We always knew that Jerusalem was a powerful and flourishing city during the Iron Age, time of the First Temple period. But when we came here to dig in the city of David, no one imagined that these are the kind of items we're going to find while excavating here. The new discovery found here in the city of David is a corpus of thousands of tiny small pieces of ivory plates. Only after assembling them together and restoring them in the lab, we could have understand what were we dealing with. Plates that were decorating large furniture, maybe uh, beds or doors. So here then we see a, a pile of these very small pieces of ivory that were found in the city of David. And here they're laid out, and you can see they have um, decoration of, of rosettes. Uh, some of the pieces are colored, and uh, some were burned so badly, as you can see here, they all turned black. And that happened, according to the excavators, during the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in 586. And here they uh, got a piece of wood, and they put these bits of ivory in there to give an impression of what it, uh, how it was used. And here then we got this reconstruction drawing where you can see uh, these beds or couches and the furniture here was all inlaid with little pieces of ivory and the chairs as well. And that made it a very expensive place. So when Solomon made the great throne of ivory, overlaid is pure gold, then you think of a chair well, a bit more magnificent than, than this one, but it would have had ivory inlay in the wooden parts of the chair and the rest covered over with, with gold plating. It says also in, in Amos, and that's so interesting because I, I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The house of ivory shall perish and the great house shall have an end. So Amos, who lived, who prophesied in the time of Isaiah, knew about palaces that had furniture made of, of ivory. And those people were very wealthy. It says in chapter 6 of Amos, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Woe to those nobles who lie on beds of ivory and stretch out on your couches. Well, here you can see them stretch out on the couches with ivory inlay. But of course, they, they, the wealthier they became, the more they turned away from, from God. That was in Jerusalem, just north of the city of David. And just a bit to the south of it, the remains of a large mansion, probably a summer house, the one mentioned by Amos was, was found. And here you, you can see the location of the excavations right in front of you here. 
but you've got a fantastic view here over the Temple Mount, the Kidon Valley, uh, the Mount of Olives and the Hebrew University on Mount Scopus. And, and these excavations also revealed some amazing finds. Uh, this is the view uh, before the excavations took place. And here in this area, they have been excavated. I like to call this particular view Abraham's view, because when Abram came here, you can see him on the bottom talking to Isaac, they came from Beersheba. And the first place where they would, would have been able to see Mount Moriah was in this very spot where they're excavating now. And there above the city of Salem, where Melchizedek was king, was Mount Moriah. And that is where Isaac uh, was going to be bound. So it's an interesting place with a lot of history and a fantastic view. So on, on this uh, Google map, here's the old city. Here's the Temple Mount. And here is the promenade where these particular excavations are taking place. Now, it is about a mile south of Jerusalem, of the old city. And you found these massive proto aeolic capitals. Usually you find them in, in, in royal cities. They found them in the city of David, belonging to the palace of King David. They found them in, in other places. They belong to very important buildings. And they found quite a few of them. And uh, it's just an amazing find, uh, very unexpected in this location. And here's a reconstruction drawing of this uh, summer house, which could look over the Temple Mount. And you can see how they use the capitals and, and, and here, and how you would have had a fantastic view uh, overlooking the city of Jerusalem, just like Abram and Isaac were able to look. So was this a summer house? So in Jerusalem, it gets very cold in the winter time, and people, the, the royals built um, winter palaces in the Jordan Valley near Jericho, where it is quite warm. But here we're on a high elevation, uh, it was a lot cooler than in the narrow streets of Jerusalem where most of the people lived. So are these one of the summer houses that Amos is talking about is a very sophisticated house, probably called a palace because they found in the excavations a toilet seat, as you can see, all anatomically correct. And the other ones have been found in the city of David. Now this was a very important building built by, if not the king himself, then by one of the nobles or of the high priestly family. This was a very wealthy family that could afford to build a summer house high up uh, to the south of Jerusalem. If you go another mile south, then in Ramat Rachel, there's a kibbutz, uh, they found the remains of a royal palace. Uh, it has been excavated already a long time ago, but uh, renewed excavations now. And Ramat Rachel is usually identified as Beit HaKerem, which is mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 6. So you children of Benjamin, gather yourself to flee from the midst of Jerusalem, blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a signal fire in Beit HaKerem. Beit HaKerem means the house or the place of the vineyard, for disaster appears out of the north and the great destruction. So... We saw before, here's the old city, was the Temple Mount. Here's the promenade where we saw that summer house. Now we are in Ramat Rachel, just to the bit further to the south in the direction of, of Bethlehem. So here's an aerial view of the excavations. You see you know, many excavation squares lined with sandbags and uh, massive walls there. And see the irrigation channels, all stone built. Uh, these are all newly discovered. Uh, remains. So here you can see a little street coming down from the high ground where a palace stood and here the excavators are, are working. They found most intricate irrigation systems. They're never seen outside Mesopotamia. You find them in the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and in, in Persia. They are open channels and some are closed uh, where the water travels through to prevent um, evaporation and gutters. And it was just an amazing find. And so based on illustrations from, from Assyria, the sketch shows that what it may have looked like. So there's a palace here on top, there was vegetation, trees, and here you can see the water channels, open water channels coming out, watering the, the garden. 
and uh, may have several artificial waterfalls as well. So here's an artist uh, illust uh, illustration of those gardens. So here's the palace and had an entrance into the garden, which was built on the side. They found pollen in the plaster of those water channels and the pools, and they uh, could find out what kind of vegetation was growing in these gardens. You had climbers, you got ornamental trees, you had fruit trees and uh, shrubs and bushes and a little waterfall. So it was a, an amazing find of this palace, which uh, may have belonged to King Hezekiah, or maybe earlier Uzziah, as I may have built it in like the summer house and taken over in the time of Hezekiah by royalty or by the priestly families. And it's just an interesting find. And also here they found those proto Iola capitals already a while ago. And also they found a window balustrade here. Now, these ones were known to us from ivory plaques. This one is from Nimrod, where you can see a woman looking out of a window. And here, those little pillars, so little um, barriers to prevent you from falling down. This is a similar window found in Samaria. And I always like to use this as an example of a Jezebel looking through a window when Geo came. And here's the reconstruction um, which they made in uh, Ramat Rachel, uh, a beautiful window with those little columns which they found here, or you see them on the top, and of course, with a magnificent view of Jerusalem. So these kinds are so interesting. They illustrate what um, Jeremiah said in chapter six, set up a signal fire in Beit HaKerem. Because of its high location on the towers, they used to make um, fires and they could be seen far off and people knew how to signal, how to inform other people that could see them of the news or impending disaster and whatsoever. So this gives you a real good insight in how Jerusalem operated uh, in the time between Isaiah and the Babylonian destruction.